morning and welcome to Roebuck Presbyterian Church. We're glad that you're with us today here in person or online and we thank you for setting this time aside for God, for the worship of God today. Um, you won't see any announcements in your bulletin, but I do have a few um, just to remind the elders of the church that there's going to be a brief meeting after the morning service. It will be brief. Um, the, and then the other one is that the monthly prayer bulletin uh, is now printed and out, and it's in the back, uh, on the back table there. And then also, uh, Pastor Richard won't be here beginning on Saturday of next week, so on Sunday uh, he'll be away, and, uh, and I'll still be here. And he'll be gone from Saturday to Saturday, so any calls or things that you need, uh, either let the elders know, let myself know, or deacons, uh, whichever uh, is most convenient. With that, I uh, now ask to, for you to turn to your, uh, the front of your bulletins to hear the call to worship and to respond uh, accordingly. It's from Psalm 111, verses 1 to 8. Praise the Lord. I will extol the Lord with all my heart in the counsel of the upright and in the assembly. Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. Glorious and majestic are his deeds, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works giving them the lands of other nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever, enacted in faithfulness and uprightness. Let's pray. Most gracious God, we thank you for this day in which we can come into your house. Lord, we live in a world of chaos of tribulation, affliction, and pain. And Lord, we thank you that for this brief period of time here, where we are sanctifying your day to keep it holy, we thank you, Lord, that you have invited us to come here from the rest of the week, from the rest from the week that was behind us, to look forward to the joy that is before us in Christ Jesus. Knowing, O oh Lord, that this day we, we worship you and commune with you, in preparation for what we will be doing in eternity. We pray, O oh Lord, that the worship today will be a blessing to our own hearts and minds and be pleasing before you. And that in, a, in the preaching and in our songs that will go out and up, we pray, O oh Lord, that they will be from our hearts and that they might minister to us and that we might seek your face more by them. And that we might also do so in our prayers, even as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. People of God, take your hymnals and turn to hymn 94, How Firm a Foundation, hymn 94. Stand with me as we sing.
remain standing as we confess our faith together from the Apostles' Creed found in your bulletins. And with that, I ask Christians, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. heaven, thank you again for the mercies that follow us day by day, the mercies of God that are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness to your people, to this congregation, to this family of faith. So thank you for the way you've continued to provide. Again, we 
and thanking you all for, for the ongoing work of the renovation and we do that again pray to help them as they finish their work we thank you for the giving of your people the way you have faithfully met our needs for all your kindnesses towards us through all of our afflictions the forgiveness of sins thank you especially that jennifer and graham are with us today and the blessings that samuel has known as he has seen good progress over the past few weeks thank you for that that comes from your hand and we thank you for your kindness we pray that would continue you bring him home soon so continue to meet the needs here but we pause to say thank you for all your faithful mercies and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And use your order of worship. Let's sing this hymn printed for you here across the lands, our hymn of thanksgiving. Been a few years since we've sung, but I think you'll remember us sing this together. printed there in your order of worship a corporate prayer of confession day so this is actually a prayer taken from an ancient order of worship from the egyptian church so ancient christian prayer here from a whole other part of the world let's pray this together today again using the words printed there let's pray this corporately lord our god great eternal wonderful in glory who keeps covenant and promises for those who love you with their whole heart who are the life of all the help of those who flee to you the hope of those who cry to you cleanse us from our sins secret and open and from every thought displeasing to your goodness cleanse our bodies and souls our hearts and consciences that with a pure heart and a clear soul with perfect love and calm hope we may venture confidently and fearlessly to pray to you amen and here's here what god's word says to those who pray that with faith 
It says, in Christ we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Amen. Now turn with me this morning, please, to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, as we come to God's word, to hear the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ, to consider his word, before we come to see his word in the Lord's table. 1 Corinthians 15. Fifteen. I will read verses 1 through 11. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning at verse 1. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born, for I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God, but by the grace of God. I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preached. And this is what you believed. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together for his help. Lord God in heaven, again, we come to you, we confess, without you, we can do nothing. Every hour, we need you. And the reading of the word, the preaching of the word, and hearing the word, and responding to the word, so as to be doers of the word, and coming to your table, and then being sent out to live for you. We need you, and so we come asking for your help, especially during this time for your illumination. We pray that the Word of God today would speak to the congregation to meet the spiritual needs, whether that might be salvation, coming to know the Lord, spiritual growth, wisdom, an encouragement, comforting word, a challenging word, a call to repentance. Lord, you know the hearts. So be at work this morning through your word. Lord, we would remember some of the needs of our church. I think of Mike Wilson mentioned to me this morning by Susan Hollifield, family member there dealing with Uh, with cancer, that you would show mercy to him, that the gospel may give him comfort. If he doesn't know how many days are left, if he's not a Christian, that he'll become one, and that he'd spend whatever days he has in your service, that we all might do that. Pray for our teachers who are returning to school uh, very soon, our principals like Aaron Fulmer and other teachers in our congregation like Jennifer Amick and others who work with students, that you might go with them during this time of year, keep them safe. Give them wisdom as they go about their work. Provide for whatever needs may arise. If there are interruptions or distractions or frustrations that you might provide for them. Pray for the kids who will be going. Again, that you would be merciful to them and keep them safe. That you also might, through the word preached this morning, give to all of our children here wisdom on how to live as your people while in school. Whether homeschool, public school, virtual school, private school, whatever the options may be that we all would know how to live as your people. And may your word give us that instruction this morning. So we ask for your help as we come to it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. On October 30th, 1938, going back a few years, at 8 o'clock p.m., Orson Welles began to direct a one-hour radio dramatization of of the 1898 science fiction novel, The War of the Worlds. Now, back in that day, few Americans owned a TV, but millions of Americans owned a radio. 
and they got their evening news and their evening entertainment from the radio. People would even channel surf between the radio stations back in the day. And so because of that, when the War of the Worlds broadcast began at 8 p.m., most Americans were tuned into a more popular show on NBC. And they missed the disclaimer that the dramatization was fiction and not fact. And so as people made their way over to the CBS station throughout the hour and began to listen to the dramatization, many began to believe the country was under attack. Here's how one report describes the broadcast. The broadcast began with serene music. Then an actor portraying an announcer broke in with a fake news report that several explosions of incandescent gas had occurred on Mars. In quick succession came a series of increasingly alarming, suspense-building news flashes that culminated with Martian spacecrafts crashing into a farm in Grover's Mill, New Jersey. For the rest of the hour, terror crackled over the airwaves. Breathless reporters detailed an extraterrestrial army of squid-like figures that killed thousands of Earthlings with heat rays and black clouds of poison gas as they steamrolled into New York City. Wells and the rest of the cast impersonated astronomers, state militia officials, and even the Secretary of the Interior, who sounded a lot like President Franklin D. Roosevelt. Now, despite the fact, friends, that the program included a reminder, both at intermission and again at the end, that the broadcast was not real, thousands of listeners believed it to be true. Phone calls came ringing into police departments, newspapers, and CBS. In New Jersey, which is ground zero for the invasion, National Guardsmen reported for duty. And the local police department fielded 2,000 phone calls in under two hours. History.com reports in Providence, Rhode Island, hysterical callers begged the electric company to cut power to the city to keep it safe from the extraterrestrial invaders. In later newspapers, this is even kind of serious, reported suicide attempts, heart attacks, and people fleeing metropolitan areas. Now, a little background of that is the newspapers and the radios were doing a little bit of battle because radio was getting in the newspaper's turf when it comes to how people got their news. So some of that may have been a little inflated hype on the newspaper's part, but you can see people reacted really strongly. Now we're listening to the story, I bet most of you are at least chuckling on the inside. I see a few smiles wondering, man, how could people be so duped to think that Martians had invaded? Well, you have to consider, people were used to getting their news from the radio. And also remember, 1938, we're still in the depression. People have lost their money. A year earlier, you had the Hindenburg disaster. And by the way, there was that gathering crisis in Europe threatening to ignite into war, World War II, maybe you've heard of it. You can see why the people would be rattled, why they're already on edge. And so maybe a disturbing broadcast would just be enough to make them to react as if they were getting the real thing. And when they found out they weren't getting the real thing, Many people were angry. Well, the passage that we've read from 1 Corinthians today, it is concerned with making sure we have the real thing. In this passage, Paul reminds the Corinthians of the gospel he preached to them, the gospel they believed. And he puts a lot of emphasis in this passage on what they believe. Why? Because there are certain truths that must be believed. Certain truths that a person must hold to in order to be a Christian. Certain truths that a church must affirm in order to be truly Christian. Otherwise, as Paul says in verse 2, you have believed in vain. Getting a fake gospel and getting a fake church is a matter of eternal light and death. So what then are the essential truths that make a person and a church authentically Christian? As we will see in this passage this morning, 
all the truths that are essential are bound up with the gospel. The gospel tells us which truths are essential for Christianity. So let's look at this passage to see two reasons why the gospel gives you authentic Christianity. And here's the first. The gospel gives you authentic Christianity because authentic Christianity greets you with the gospel. Authentic Christianity greets you with the gospel. You ever get a phone call, and most of us are smart enough not to take it these days, and maybe you get tricked, and it's just a sales pitch. If you don't hang up, what are you thinking? Okay, just get to the point. What is it you are asking me? I'm that way, whether it's a ministry thing, a sales thing, or whatever. Just, just don't give me the elaborate setup. Get right to the point. Tell me the main idea. Well, Paul does that right here in this passage. Notice verse 3. For what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance. As far as Paul is concerned, the gospel is the most important and should be the most prominent Christian belief. Now, why is that? Back up to verse 1. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. Paul preached the gospel to the Corinthians, and it saved them. They received the good news, and the good news determines their existence as believers. To put it simply, they wouldn't be Christians without the gospel. That's why Paul goes on and warns them in verse 2. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you had believed in vain. The gospel saved them. But if they move away from the gospel, then their identity as Christians will be meaningless. There is no Christianity without the gospel. When Paul says, you may have believed in vain, he isn't talking about people who think they believe, but they really haven't. Maybe you've had that experience, or you know people who have. They thought they were Christians, but they didn't truly believe. Paul's actually not talking about those kinds of people here. He's talking about people who have believed the wrong content. And so the profession of their faith is empty. Paul is telling the Corinthians, you believed this Gospel, and he'll remind us of its content in just a minute. And that gospel saved you. Therefore, the priority of the gospel means the gospel determines authentic Christianity. You can identify an authentic Christian. You can identify an authentic Christian church by the profession of the gospel. One author puts it like this. The gospel is the primary category. For understanding Christian fellowship. You ever hear churches talk about fellowship? Hear churches talk about unity? Christians have unity when they unite around something. And that something is the gospel. You know, a lot of churches actually have more unity than you think. But what they're unified around isn't the gospel. They may be unified around a person, or they may be unified around a, a personality, or a certain principle, or maybe even a place. But the rallying point for the Christian church is the gospel. And Christians will have unity when they unite around that. And Christians will have fellowship when they hold certain things in common. So what should we hold in common? It is the gospel. One author refers to the gospel as the common ground of the whole church. The gospel gives us our unity in Christ. And so authentic Christianity greets you with the gospel. Now here's the second idea. This is where we'll spend the bulk of our time. Authentic Christianity teaches you essential gospel truths. Authentic Christianity teaches you essential gospel truths. Beginning with verse 3, Paul begins to elaborate on the content of the gospel he received and proclaimed to the Corinthians. So having laid down its fundamental importance, he now moves to its essential content. 
Now here's the question. Why does Paul feel the need to describe the gospel that they already hold in common? Well, 1 Corinthians 15, you probably know, it's one of Paul's best-known passages where he teaches that everyone who believes the gospel will one day bodily rise from the dead. There will be a resurrection unto life for believers. This is the most extended chapter in the Bible that talks about our resurrection. And based on what Paul says in this chapter, particularly verse 12, it appears some or many of the Corinthian Christians were denying that they would one day rise from the dead. Now follow me here. I've often heard it said, I bet you've heard it said too, that the Corinthian Christians were denying Jesus' resurrection from the dead. But read the chapter. Paul does not actually say that. What he says is, if you deny your future resurrection, that implies Christ did not rise in the past. You see, they had a problem with bodily resurrection. They thought, you want to get rid of the body so the soul can be free. Why would anybody want the body to rise from the dead? And they were stumbling over it. But Paul says, if you deny your future resurrection, you're implying Christ could not have risen from the dead. But since Christ did rise, and you believe that, that guarantees that in the future, you will rise. So here's his method. Paul appeals to a doctrine they already believe, the resurrection of Christ, in order, in order to convince them to believe something they ought to believe, their future bodily resurrection. Now here's why that's a big deal. Paul appeals to the gospel as the core idea that generates other Christian doctrines. Because the gospel is foundational, because it's primary, it serves as the foundation on which Paul builds additional Christian beliefs. That is Paul's method. There are doctrines that the gospel proclaims, and there are doctrines that the gospel implies. And in certain instances, the implied doctrines are as essential as the gospel itself. In other words, the gospel can't make sense if certain doctrines are denied. So the question that is before us is, well, which ideas does the gospel demand? How do we know which ideas are essential and which ones aren't? And that's what we're going to spend the rest of our time looking at this morning. What are the fundamental or the essential doctrines of a Christian church? What does the gospel directly demand or necessarily apply? And we can actually get it right from this passage. And I'm just going to give you a sketch, but I want you to follow me now as we walk through Paul's short summary of the gospel, because it will provide a wealth of doctrinal material. Look at just the short line that ends verse 3. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. First, Paul refers to a historical event. Christ died. Now, by the way, in and of itself, that is not a revolutionary statement. A lot of people died on a Roman cross both before Jesus' day and after his day. But notice that Paul doesn't give us a bare fact. He goes on to interpret the significance of that event. Christ died for our sins. The death of Jesus Christ on the cross solves the problem of human sin. We've moved from facts, Christ died, to doctrines, Christ died for our sins. And in this instance, doctrines that have ultimate impact on your eternal well-being. So let's dig a little deeper in the statement. Paul says Christ died for our sins. Well, how should we understand the idea of sin? What is sin? Well, Paul's named a lot of sins already in this letter. Here's just the outline. He talks about incest adultery, greed, 
idolatry, slander, homosexual conduct, stealing, drunkenness, the use of prostitutes, misapplication of gender roles, abuse of the Lord's table, falsifying spiritual gifts, bickering with one's fellow Christians, judging the motives of others, preening over one's own superiority, engaging in crooked business dealings, suing fellow Christians, and even cursing Christ. That's a pretty comprehensive list, and that's just 1 Corinthians, for starters. Here's what I want you to see. All of those sins are personal actions committed against a personal God. Sin is something you do, and it is ultimately against someone who says, you should not do that. So therefore, all sin is a rejection of God as the ultimate authority and lawgiver, and all such rejection brings guilt. Otherwise, we would not need Jesus to die for our sins. But not only that, when we sin against this personal God, who is he? He is an eternally righteous God. And so our, our sins have eternal significance. And this righteous God must hold sins accountable or he's not just. So there will be a future judgment. And there will be punishment rendered for those who are guilty of sin. And the punishment, follow me here, must reflect the eternal nature of the person sinned against. So that is why we talk about the punishment for sins being eternal. Because you, I, we are finite, limited beings. And we have sinned against an eternal, infinite, righteous God. And so it is absolutely impossible for creatures like you and me to satisfy the justice of God on our own. If we could, that would strike against the very nature of there being one eternal God who made all things and set the laws and to whom we are ultimately accountable. Now you say, wow, that's pretty bad. Well, it's the badness of the bad news. That makes the goodness of the good news so good. So when Paul says Christ died for our sins, he is saying, how's the statement begin? Christ died. So we see what a big deal sin is. But now think about that first part. Christ died. This Christ took the eternal punishment for your sin in his own body in time and space. And he did that to pay for the guilt of your sins. So your sins were credited to Christ. And when he died, he actually satisfied that eternal wrath against you. So that you could be forgiven. So that you could be accepted by God. And so we not only affirm Christ died for our sins, we affirm that death actually satisfies his wrath. It's essential we understand his death under those terms. And finally, with all this talk of Jesus dying, we should ask this question. Who is this Christ? Does it matter what you think about him? Or as long as you name the name of Jesus, you're good to go. I mean, could John the Baptist have died for your sins? Could Martin Luther have died for your sins? Absolutely not. Why not? Because they're not qualified to be the sin bearer. We just said your sin is a sin against an eternal God. Therefore, Jesus must be able to pay the eternal price for sin. He must be able to bear eternal punishment for us in the space of time. Therefore, it is absolutely essential that Jesus be God himself fully equal to the Father, sharing of the full essence of the divine nature. But not only that, Jesus must be able to represent the very people who sinned against God. I mean, who sinned? We sinned. Creatures. Humans. So if someone's going to stand in our place, they have to be a human. They have to have a fully human nature. Or else they cannot give God the creator the obedience we fail to offer 
in the Garden of Eden, and that every human has failed to offer ever since. So Jesus must be God, and yet he must be man. He must be one person, distinct from the Father, yet equal in essence to the Father, able to live, die, and rise again in our place in order to save us. Now look, I grant you, that's a massive amount of information. But it's good to just give it all to you at once and ask this question. Do you find every statement I just made in the short summary we've read? No. But here's the point. What Paul says in those statements doesn't make sense without the connections <laughs> that we have just made to other doctrinal truths. So when Paul makes these short statements, they're actually resting on a much larger foundation. Maybe they're like an iceberg. We get the tip of the iceberg in 1 Corinthians 15. But you don't get that tip of the iceberg without the 90% of the iceberg that's underwater. And these doctrinal truths are all attested by Scripture, but they're all vitally connected to the gospel. Which brings me, by the way, to one of the last fundamental ideas that Paul hints at here. Paul says Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He says in verse 4 that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. How do you know that any of the events I've just mentioned are true? Because the Bible tells us so. God's word gives us an authoritative, inerrant revelation of what happened in the gospel events and how we should understand those events. You see, as far as Paul is concerned, these events really happened. Christ died and rose again. We know he died because he was buried. We know he rose again because he was seen by so many witnesses. There were objective historical events. They actually left behind a trail of evidence. And some Christian teachers have done a great job of following that trail and defending the Christian faith. And yet ultimately, the final authority for believing those events and for believing that understanding is the revelation of God in the scriptures. And so that leaves one ultimate question. The payoff, you want to write, what's the point of all that information? It's this. How do I come to enjoy the benefits of the gospel? Paul says it in verse 10. By the grace of God, I am what I am. You can come to enjoy the benefits and the new life of the gospel on the basis of God's grace. He loves you. He has given you what you do not deserve in Christ so that you can be forgiven of your sins. So that you can be saved from the wrath of God. There is nothing you can do to earn it. But you get it fully. When you trust in Christ. And surrender yourself to him. And that shows, by the way, where all these truths were going. Aaron said it well in Sunday school. It's, there's a difference between believing in God. And believing God. Now the doctrinal truths are absolutely important. What kind of God am I believing but having seen what kind of God you're believing, the doctrinal truths are the bus. Get on the bus and let it take you to the destination, which is to believe God and to know him and to trust him and to rest on him. Because maybe you're wondering after giving all these truths, okay, wait, 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 pump the brakes. Are you saying a person must know and affirm all of these ideas in order to be saved? No, that's not what I'm saying. Some of the information here, of course you have to know it, because what else are you believing in? But many of these ideas are presupposed. They're implied by the gospel and learned later. So here's what I would say. No Christian or church can deny any of these doctrines without implicitly denying the gospel itself. So these truths, it's not an entrance exam. But it is a boundary. And outside that boundary, there is no Christianity. To reject these doctrines, to reject, to reject these ideas, is to reject Christ himself. 
And so as a Christian church, that's what we are, first and foremost. We'll talk in days to come about what it means to be Presbyterian, but we are first and foremost Christians. And so we affirm these ideas, and we seek to teach them to you. Now let me say this, maybe with all this talk of essential doctrines, fundamental doctrines, maybe that makes some people uneasy. Maybe that calls to mind strident fundamentalists or fundamentalisms of the past that ironically obscured the gospel in your experience. That is an irony of fundamentalism. A movement founded to protect the gospel has in some quarters down through the years actually obscured the gospel. And so when you hear talk about fundamental doctrines, that's where your mind goes. Well, there's a great irony that talking about the doctrines, talking about essential gospel doctrines, can actually protect against abuses. How so? Because it tells us which ideas are negotiable and which ones aren't. So there are some churches, they have far too few doctrines on their list of essential doctrines. And those churches end up calling people to unity and fellowship. That's not grounded in the gospel. They have Christian as a name, but they are not truly Christian. But other churches, they have too many doctrines on their list. And they impose beliefs on people that God himself does not require for Christian identity. Some of those doctrines have been exalted to the level of fundamental doctrine, first tier doctrine, and they don't belong there. So if a doctrine does not impact the integrity of the gospel, it is not essential for salvation or for Christian identity. I am not saying it is utterly irrelevant. I am Presbyterian for a reason. But such secondary doctrines, or even further down, should never be given ultimate significance when it comes to determining what is a Christian. And lastly, I'll leave you with this note of hope. <coughs> the centrality of the gospel gives us hope for unity and fellowship. You know, there are a lot of things, there are many things that the people in this room don't have in common. Some of you are related to one another. Some of you are not. Some of you grew up in this area. Some of you did not. Some of you have been in this church a long time. Some of you have not. There are all sorts of different views in this room on current issues. But do you know what everyone in this room can hold in common? The gospel of Jesus Christ. Christ. And we can use that to build our unity and our fellowship as a congregation. So I would leave you with this encouragement. Maybe this week you could try to get to know someone in this church better than you already do. And you say, well, how do I do that? Start by having a conversation about the gospel. Stop someone in the parking lot. Though that will be awkward, right? If someone comes up to you and says, let's talk about the gospel. Like, oh, this guy's really trying to do what was said this morning. Okay, so maybe you call them in a week or so. Maybe you go to lunch and you talk about how, how did you become a Christian? Some of you have known the Lord from the first day in terms of you grew up knowing the Lord. You don't remember when you weren't a Christian or a believer in Christ. Others of you came to know the Lord at a later age and you can talk about that reality and how it has shaped the person you are today. But whatever the case, a commitment to the gospel, placing it at the center of our ministry, is the most important step in building a strong church and having Christian fellowship and unity. We don't want, we ought not to rally around anything else. But if we put that in the center, then we can build towards unity and fellowship. And if you don't believe the gospel, then we would love to know why not. The elders of this church, the pastor of this church, we would love to know why you don't yet believe. And we would, we would love to see how we can introduce you to the Lord and tell you more about his good news. So let's pray and give thanks for that as we come to this communion table. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we 
Thank you for the good news that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried, that he was raised the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen. And that he is currently reigning and will one day come again to put the last enemy, death, under his feet by raising the righteous from the dead. And we pray that day would come quickly. And we pray that as we wait for it, unbelievers would come to know you. We would grow in our unity and fellowship and love for the gospel. That as a church, we would mature and put the gospel central. And that it would give us our marching orders. And that we would do all things well for the glory of God. Forgive us of our sins. And thank you for your many mercies. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's sing in response in 347. The church is one foundation. Again, as we prepare to come to the Lord's table in 347. There's two verses on the next page. Don't miss those. Stand with me, please. seated. Let me read these words of institution as we come now to the Lord's table. 1 Corinthians 11 says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. 
Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We read words like this whenever we have the Lord's table because there needs to be significance to what we are doing. We need to have the authority to actually do what we're doing with these particular elements. And we see from the passage we've read, this is something Jesus has commanded us to do. To take bread and wine and to show forth his death. That friend, his body was given for you. His blood was given for you. We talked about pledges a few weeks ago when we discussed baptism. This is the other pledge he's given us. A token that God means business that he has acted for you. To save you for your sins. And friends, that's what we call condescension. I mean, why would God give us so many reminders and do so much for our sake? Who are slow to believe and need so much help. That is who God is. It's why we read that God is love, because it's the attribute that he shows us over and over again in the gospel. So as you come to this table this morning, assuming that you've, you know the Lord, you've repented of your sins before him, please come with peace of conscience. Blood was shed, his body was broken to forgive you and invites you to come to this table to commune with him by faith. This is just bread and juice. We are dedicating it for a special purpose. But it's not becoming anything else. But this is a meal where Christ will be present. So as your faith is focused on the reality, the blood and body of the Lord, so that Lord will strengthen you. Why are you going to go home and eat lunch? You need protection against hunger. Your soul needs strength and protection in communing with Christ will give you that strength and protection. And perhaps best of all, in light of what we thought about this morning, why do we call it communion? This is a family meal. We commune with God. We commune with one another around the gospel during this time. Now, because of that, we always give this warning for your sake. If you're not of that family, this is the family meal. If you're not in that family of God yet, then please do not partake. The Bible warns against those who come into the covenant community and aren't really members of it. They come to this table and judgment is sometimes the result. So if you're not a believer, if you haven't yet professed that faith before a church that says, all right, on the basis of the Bible, you're a Christian. We, we hear that profession and been admitted that membership. If you haven't done it yet, hold off. If you've done that, the church has asked you not to eat from the table because of sin. Hold off. If you're not there yet, again, come see us today. Let's get you into the family all the way so we can eat at the table together. But let's come now and enjoy this short meal together. Let me pray to set these elements apart and give thanks. Father in heaven, again, we thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ, his broken body, his shed blood, his triumphant resurrection, and his soon return. So we take these elements that we've all received when we come in, we dedicate them to you for this special purpose. And pray that as we eat and drink, so our faith would latch on to you and that you would make your people strong. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can go ahead and get ready to eat the bread if anybody else needs any. El has them. Anyone else need the elements? The Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples, as I, ministering in his name, has given this bread to you. And he said, take, eat, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I'd also like to open your cup. Because in the same manner, Christ took the cup. He gave thanks, as we have done in his name. He gave it to his disciples, saying, This cup 
is a new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Drink from it, all of you. Let's give thanks again. Lord, we do thank you for your rich mercy, goodness which we cannot value that you have shown us and pledged in the communion meal. Again, forgive us of our sins. Forgive us for when our worship is not pleasing to you or according to your word. But thank you that you accept our persons. You accept our works because of the blood of Christ and that perfect obedience of the Son. I pray today for Roebuck Presbyterian Church. Thank you for this congregation and pray that we would persevere in the faith, that no one would take our crown, that our conversation would be as becomes the gospel. Uh, we would bear about with us continually the dying of the Lord Jesus so that his life may be manifested in these mortal bodies. Grant, Lord, that our light will so shine before others that they can see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So stand with me then. <clears throat> to be dismissed with God's blessing, I invite you to, you're welcome to lift up your hands even, to lift up your eyes and Receive God's blessing. May the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, may he make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.